Things are starting to get keyed up around Jesus. Um, he's drawing a deeper, darker line uh, in the sand, if you will, between himself and those who are not of him. I mean, was the last time you heard a preacher look at the people in his congregation and point out different ones and say, you're of the devil, you're of the devil. Now, uh, they're out there, okay? Um, but you don't hear about it too often, especially in regards to a, a right statement of truth, a discernment of the true nature of an individual. And, of course, Jesus is not doing this in a corner. He's doing this in public. They're in the temple. They're still in the temple area. Um, he's talking to the same Jewish leaders and the Jews that were, were there around him since, you know, verse 12, really, uh, of this 8th chapter. Nothing's changed. And, of course, it's going to be the same all the way to the end. Uh, when we ended last week's study, last week's teaching, we ended, of course, at verse 30. We had an interesting statement there made by John. In verse 30 of the 8th chapter, it says, As he, Christ, spoke these things, many came to believe in him. And that's a real launching pad for us for tonight as we get into tonight's text. So let's read the text together from verse 31 down to 37. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free, they answered him. We are Abraham's descendants and have never yet been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say we will become free? Jesus answered them. Amen, amen, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, yet you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. So looking at your outline, tonight we're going to talk about discerning discipleship from devilship. Yes, I made up another word. Discerning discipleship from devilship. In the first point where he gives the distinctives of discipleship, which are word, truth, and freedom, we just read that, that's all he's going to say about discipleship to these individuals. Now keep in mind, uh, there's others around as well. We don't know all who, but we know that there, there was just a group of, of general Jewish people that were there, as well as the Jewish leaders who are referred to as the Jews. Remember, when you see that in John's Gospel, most of the time, you can tell from the context, it's referring to the Jewish leadership. So you've got Sanhedrin members here. These are the ones that are in the process, as Jesus is, is teaching along here, they're in the process of planning his death. They're working towards his death. So this is the nature of these people, and we've already seen it uh, to a great degree already. I think John's gospel just really uh, explodes and pulls the, 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 the screen, the, the, the curtain back on the, the nature uh, of these individuals, these, these religious leaders in particular. John really does it strong here. So this distinctness of discipleship, he gives us what that is and defines it in verses 31 through 32. And then secondly... You'll see from the second point, the third point, and the fourth point, now we're dealing with the deception of devilship, where they bring up this issue of we're Abraham's descendants. And this deception of devilship has to do with we're okay because of ethnic descent. That's what they're saying. That's a deception from hell. Thirdly, in verses 35 and 36, he'll talk about the definition. So we move from the deception of devilship to the definition of it. And this is where... They speak about the fact that we're not slaves to anybody, but Jesus says anybody who commits sin is a slave of sin, but they're thinking slavery in another area, and they're making a couple of mistakes when they make this comment to Jesus. We'll discover what those mistakes are. Fourth and finally, there is this declaration of devilship where they're clearly looking to murder him. Jesus outs them about that in public, and the people already know it. We've already seen it before that the crowd earlier in chapter 7 said to one another, um, is this not the one that they're trying to kill? 
So they're not really hiding it too well. It's gotten out. And as popular as Jesus was uh, at that time, um, when somebody's going to, you can't keep, you know, a, a, a plan of death, a plan of murder, quiet too long, especially when there's that many people that know about Jesus and witness uh, the, uh, the give and take and the, and the battle between him and the Jewish leaders. They know it's got to come to something. They know anybody else that battles the Jewish leadership in the Sanhedrin is looking for some serious trouble. And this Jesus is just so bold about it. I mean, doesn't he have any sense at all? He's just so in their face. And yet he keeps pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing. See, Because when you know who you are, and this is the secret, if you will, uh, to Jesus' uh, strength publicly, it, when you know who you are, you, you don't fear men, you don't fear what they can do. All they can do is... is is kill him, but they can't do it in accordance with their own agenda. Remember, we looked at that already, too. They've tried, and it wasn't... John keeps coming back and says, it's not Jesus' time. It's not the Lord's time, it's not the Lord's time, it's not the Lord's time. Because they've tried to kill him already. You know, They tried to kill him in his hometown. That's why I don't go back to Montebello. <laughs> they tried to kill him, you know... Uh, you know, he gets up in his own church. You just don't go back to your home church and preach a bad sermon. You know, what could happen? It'll lead him out to the brow of the hill. And it's fascinating, isn't it? Because it just sort of leaves you hanging there. Just enough information to leave you go, ah, it says that they led him to the edge of the cliff. And it, all the text says is that he passed through them and went his way. Now, now I suggest you don't read anything into that, Okay. I would suggest that what you've got here is just a case of exactly what it says. Uh, his time was not yet, and I'm not going to suggest what he, he gave this glare to them. No, I'm not going to suggest anything like that. That's all it says. But he faces death again and again and again, and it never gets a hold of him. Why? Because in John chapter 10, we're going to see, he says, nobody can what? Take my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it again. Yeah, resurrection, right? So it's important that, that those who are around him at this moment uh, understand what the bedrock three-point issue is of discipleship, the three most important things, in light of this incredible devilship that's paraded in front of them in all of this religious self-righteous garb, that, uh, their clothes, their attitude, you know, everything. So let's consider then this first point, this distinctives of discipleship that begin in verse 31. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who believed in him, uh, and that refers back to what verse? Ah, 30. So let's look at 30. As he spoke these things, many came to believe in him. Well, what things? Well, verse 28 when you lift up the Son of Man, he's telling them that they're going to put him to death. When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am. That's the second occurrence, direct occurrence of him claiming to be the I am. The first occurrence in this chapter is verse 24. Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. As I said to you before, the he there italicized afterwards, not in the Greek text if you have a translation that doesn't have the he italicized, that's unfortunate. Scratch the word out anyway. All it says is a go at me. And uh, we spent a lot of time last week dealing with the importance of the I am statements. Very powerful. But let's just move along now. Hopefully you will remember and recall some of those things we talked about. Verse 29 now. He, and he who sent me is with me, the Father. He has not left me alone, for I always do those things which are pleasing to him. We talked about that last week. Let's just make that you know, the moniker of our lives. To always do the things that please him. And I think I said to you on Sunday when we were talking about part two of the payday, uh, being before Christ's Bema Seat, you know, how do I get a positive Bema Seat judgment experience? No, just do all things that please him. Doesn't that pretty much take care of it right about there, right? Well, what pleases him? Well, it's right here in the Word. See? So you've got to be in the Word every day to know what pleases him. So he says this, I always do those things that please him. And then interesting, in 30, as he spoke these things, many came to believe in him. But now, what I, want, what I ended last week on was this. Notice here that in verse 31, so he was saying to those Jews who had believed in him. 
So I love it when the Bible does that, self-interpreting like that. Like, who are those in verse 30 who believed in him? And what kind of a belief are we talking about here? Uh, and then right away in 31, well, it's those Jews who believed in him, and he speaks directly to them. He does it here. He, he does it, uh, he reminds us again in verse 48, verse 48, the Jews answered and said to him. He does it in verse 52, the Jews said to him. Verse 57, so the Jews said to him, and then 59, those same Jews picked up stones to throw at him. Another attempted murder gone awry. And these are the same individuals that verse 30 says believed in him. How could this be? Because you know what's in between all this. Jesus is going to turn to those who believed in him and say, you're of your father the devil. My father didn't give birth to you. He's going to say this to them. And they're the ones, he's going to accuse them of trying to kill him. These are the ones who believed in him. That doesn't, what? How could, huh? What do you mean? Huh? Uh, believe in him, but I want to kill him? See, once again, John is very plain on his face, and he starts this back in chapter 2, verse 23, verse 24. And I, I think I said to you last week, after verse 30, just write chapter 2, verse 23 through 25, 2, 23 through 25, because that's that, that keystone passage, that interpretive grid that tells us that just because somebody says they believe in him or I, John, report that a certain person or persons believe in him, that does not mean it's salvific belief. It does not necessarily mean that it's a saving faith because the word for belief and faith in Greek, you know, episto or pisteo are the same. The noun or the verb is it, faith comes from that, okay? Um, people believe for different reasons. I have no idea what these Jews were believing in about him because the text doesn't say. But what is important here is to understand that just because somebody says they believe on Jesus doesn't mean that they've been given a new nature. Because when you believe, you don't bring on the new nature. When you believe uh, is not the tripstone for then the uh, Adamic sin nature leaves. That is not it. God does it. For, regeneration is always always precedes faith in the Scripture. Regeneration, God has to do the work first. See, that's what Jesus taught Nicodemus in John chapter three. You see how important John's gospel is. That that unless a man is born from above, he can't see or enter the kingdom of God. Born from above, that's Jewish terminology, meaning God takes the action. God has to do it first. He's not waiting for you to believe. Not waiting for you to believe. He's not waiting. He's not wringing his hands up there. And I know you all know that. But like I said to you last week, I have different people listening to this or at different stages and understanding of Scripture. So, you know, uh, God's not waiting for you to believe. He's not wringing his hands. He's not going, oh, my gosh, if Hank doesn't believe in me, I don't know what I'm going to do. You know, that's, it's just not happening. That's that, that's that on the back of your uh, bulletin from last week. It's the guy trying to bring the skeleton back to life. Arminian CPR. Come on, just pray the sinner's prayer. You can do it. You can do it. Come on. Crunch, crunch. Oh, I broke a rib. Yeah, yeah. And so these guys believe on him, but 223 through 25 says that there were people who believed on him then because of his miracles, but he did not, he did not pistulate, he did not entrust himself or give his faith back to them because he knew all men. He knew what was in men. So, you see, here's the thing. If Jesus is not giving you the faith, the faith that you say you have is not a genuine saving faith. Uh, it's an intellectual assent to a proposition. It's an intellectual assent to a proposition. It's the same belief, and I've used this before, I know, ad infinitum, ad nauseum. I believe the tide will get my clothes cleaner, then all will get my clothes cleaner. Well, so what? And maybe it does, but so what? That's an opinion. I like a certain type of drum head and a certain type of drum stick. Another guy thinks they're terrible. That's a matter of opinion. It's good in your hands. It's purely subjective. It's on this under the sun level subjectivity. Everybody's concept of Jesus, you know, is just too wild and varied. And that's why we have an administration like we have in this country. Because the right Jesus has never been preached to the masses. In an, in an entire uh, national sense, we have too many different Jesuses. So what we're going to do, Joanna, is we're going to 
have all of the people in this church, including you. Thank you. She, her hand was up here, and the angel went like that, just like we prayed. No scratching on there. And you all are going to have to teach the real Jesus. This is the foundation that we build on. So Jesus was saying, verse 31, to those Jews who believed in him, number one, if, if you continue... <laughs> Qualifier, right? If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. If you, meneo, in this case, second person plural, meneate, if you continue to abide in my word, you're my disciple. So first qualifier for a distinctive of discipleship is abiding not in just any word, but Jesus says, my word, my word. Jesus takes possession of not only all, and ownership of not only all the things that he preached and taught, but he, in the Gospels, takes possession and ownership over all of the Old Testament as he quotes it and interprets it and says exactly what it means and challenges uh, the interpretive grid of the scribes and the Pharisees of his day for getting it wrong. That's what Matthew 5 through 7 is all about. Him, Him turning around and correcting what the scribes and the Pharisees had interpreted the world badly over. So he says, it's my word. The Apostle Paul was raised up to continue to give revelation of Jesus' word, and everything Paul taught is Jesus' teaching. He says, if you you continue in my word, uh, Jesus uh, came and brought, after his resurrection, anointing to the disciples, told them in advance Matthew 16, Matthew 18, gives them the keys, says whatever you bind on earth has already been bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth has already been loosed in heaven. You're just mirroring what heaven, and that's another Jewish terminology, it means God, heaven, God, what he has already determined, you then enact based upon what he's already said and done and and has willed. And so the boys then become teachers. And they go out and they're preaching and they're writing epistles and they're starting churches. And the Holy Spirit segregates a certain amount of them, the Gospels, the epistles, and they're all the words of Jesus. And then the church, way before any council came together, no council ever came together to define what books are canonical. Remember I've told you that before? The church in the first three centuries, prior to that, in the first, in the first and second century, were already recognizing which were canonical, which were inspired, which were from God, and which were not. The churches were receiving them. Now, that's a historical fact. And so then here comes Athanasius, fourth century, in his festal letter, 29 or something like that, and he gives the 37 books of the New Testament, says these are the inspired canonical books. But all he's doing, he's not establishing anything. All he's doing is making reference to what the church, the church is, the little groups like ours, and larger groups, had already agreed to en masse together. That's how the canon was closed and recognized as closed. What was accepted, what, what was not, you see. And so when Jesus says, if you continue to abide, continue, menete, continue to live in my word, continue to dwell in my word. Menete can also mean, uh, from meneo, to await, to await my word. If you're a person that is living, dwelling, continuing to await, abide, live in my word, that's the first step of knowing you're a disciple. That's the first distinctive. So just like you abide with air in your lungs... So you must have the word daily, continuously. That's a disciple. What's a disciple? That's a mathetes. Uh, that's a disciplined learner, as you probably already know, because I've told you that before. That's a disciplined learner. Uh, you know, Jesus was not the first man to have disciples. There were others. There were Jewish disciples of different Jewish leaders of the school of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They had their disciples. They're referred to in the Gospels, as a matter of fact. Paul even had uh, disciples, those who followed after him. I I consider myself a disciple of Paul because that's the order. You have to follow Paul as he follows Christ. That's the order for us, see? You're not denying that you're... We're not saying you're not a disciple of Christ. We're saying that Paul brings Christ to us and Christ has set aside Paul in order to do that. And so a disciple... Generally speaking, was somebody who uh, 
who didn't just sort of, yeah, I kind of agree with this. I like that guy's church. I think I'll go to that guy's church. Yeah, that's not a disciple. A disciple was somebody who was really required to adopt the philosophy, the practices, and the way of life of their teacher. That's what a disciple was. A disciple adopts the philosophy, the practices, and the way of life of their teacher. There was usually close proximity. And so that's why you see uh, the boys, the, the 12 here, uh, stepping aside from their work, walking away from their jobs and their families. We don't know if they didn't see them. They might have seen them uh, during that three and a half year period. It's very likely. But pretty much their job was now being trained by Jesus. That was their job as a disciple. So there was that close proximity. Um, so when Jesus says, number one, here's the first distinctive, if you continue my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. By the way, the Greek word there for truly is alithos, alithos, and it can actually be translated, defined rather, as actually, actually. And I like that for right here. I think that works fabulously. It really kind of opens it up. If you continue in my word, then you are actually my disciples. In other words, you're not pretending. You really are my disciples. You're actually a disciple. This is actually true. What are the actual facts? Well, actually, this is it. See? So, Jesus seems to think that following his word made you a disciple. Um, it's the very thing that uh, was pointed out in John 6. Verses 65 and 66. And he was saying, For this reason I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted him from the Father. As a result of this, that is verse 65, as a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. Um. A disciple was required to take on the philosophy, the practices, and the way of life of the teacher. And now they didn't like what he had to say. They didn't like the idea that Jesus says, nobody can come to me unless it's granted, given to him by the Father. The Father must make the first step, or it's not going to happen. Pray all the sinner's prayers you want. It's not going to happen. And they didn't like that. See, stop and think about this for a second. Arminianism really is this. It really is. It's a withdrawing from Christ. Because Arminianism says, no, ah, my will is pro prominent. My will is prevalent. My will is first. God will never go against a person's will. That's why we have free will. It's just the dumbest thing. When you, if you're going to talk Bible, it's not even, on the, it's not even here. What is here, however... Uh, is the fact that God, God's preeminent desire and will precedes first. He says, they withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. In 1 John 2.19, I've got to make some tracks here. It says, Jesus says that these antichrists went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us, but they went out, so it would be shown that they were not of us in the first place. See, Arminian theology is a, is a, is a departing from Christ. Christ said, no one can come to the Father, or me, unless it's been given unto him by the Father. And the result of that is many of his disciples withdrew from him. That's why... One of the big reasons why I have such a heartburn with that entire uh, theological philosophy. It's not exegetical doctrine. It's philosophy. It's just philosophy. And so there's a withdrawing that takes place. You go back to John chapter 8 now. And he says, secondly, in verse 32, under the distinctives of discipleship, we've first seen word is the number one description. Now what about truth? Verse 32. And, because you're in my word, you're actually my disciples, you will know the truth. You will know the truth. If you're in the Word, see, I love the simplicity of this. If you're in the Word, you will know the truth. If you're in Christ, a new creation in Christ, 
And the Holy Spirit is inside of you to declare the truth of the Word to you, to illuminate the truth of the Word. Remember I told you a few Sundays back that, that all the Holy Spirit does, if you didn't have a Bible, there would be no illumination. Because that's the job of the Holy Spirit, is to illuminate that to us. It's what John meant in 1 John 2.20 and 2.27. The anointing that you have received abides in you. It's talking about the Holy Spirit. And you don't need any man to teach you. Talking about those docetic Gnostics, right? But as the same Spirit teaches you of all things, is truth and is no lie, abide in Him, He says. 1 John 2.20 he says, you have an anointing from the Holy One and you know all things. It does, obviously, it's talking about the things of the Word. But th what a confidence this is. This is incredible. Uh, in John 16 and verse 13, he says, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will lead you into all truth. He says that to the 12. Judas is gone, so it's the 11. He says he'll lead you into all truth. He'll take of mine. He'll show it to you. He'll show you things to come. Why? So you can write it down. So I can preserve it. So I can put it in Keith's and Tony and Jen's, you know, and Ann's hands and Larry's hands and Frank's and Brian's. And... Isn't that incredible? Isn't that fabulous? See? And the church, by the Holy Spirit, is recognizing this is the Word of God. And so truth then, you will know the truth. By the way, this is, there's a fascinating verse in Luke, the first chapter. I want you to look at it. Luke, the first chapter, in the first four verses, talk about how the word written down and the result being to know exactly what the word means by what it says. Luke 1, verses 1 through 4. Luke says, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, means the other uh, apostles, just as they were handed down to us, so the things that of truth about Christ that is going to be in loose gospel have been handed down to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the world. That's the twelve. It seemed fitting for me as well, watch this, having, number one, investigated everything carefully from the beginning. So the Holy Spirit is inspiring this man to write that that the things in Luke's Gospels have been investigated carefully from the beginning. You can really put confidence in this. Secondly, to write it out for you in consecutive order, O most excellent Theophilus. Why? So that you might know the exact truth about the things that you have been taught. 1 Timothy 3.15 1 Timothy 3.15 says that the church is the pillar and ground of what? The truth. The pillar and ground of the truth. The church is not the truth. It's the pillar. The pillar holds up the roof. The ground is the foundation. So you've got that which you stand on. You've got that which holds everything up and provides covering. And it's the pillar and ground of the truth. So the truth is in the church. That doesn't mean every church that claims to be a Christian church is of the truth necessarily but he's talking about the mystical church the true church of christ that which god calls all the elect into there's lots of people that hang around churches uh, on the earth uh, they hang, that doesn't necessarily make them a part of that church but the church that is called of god is the pillar and ground of the truth he says right here in first john 4 6 he has more insight about this about the truth coming through 1 John 4, 6, listen to this. He says, we are from God. Now, the we here is a reference, John's reference to the other apostles. We are from God. He who knows God listens to us. There's your first clue right there. He who knows God has relationship with God. In other words, God knows him and has called him. He's the elect. Then that person, if, you, if that person is who they say they are, they will be listening to the apostles. He who is not from God does not listen to us. I like John's black and white. If you're not from God, you won't listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. That's how you discern. That's how you can know the truth by knowing the error. I, I've told uh, folks in the past, one of the best ways, I just said this to you last Sunday, one of the best ways to learn New Testament Bible doctrine is to study the cults, to study their mishmash of doctrines, the Mormons, Jehovah's Witness, so on, and compare it to Scripture. It's one of the best ways of getting to know the truth of the Scripture is arraign the error. Put the error on arraignment. See, Back in John 8, 
He says, so you will know this truth. And guess what? Three, the third distinctive of discipleship is the truth will make you free. The truth will make you free. Jesus prayed in John 17, 17 to the Father, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And the church recognized this from the beginning. And you're a part of that. You're a, you're a direct descendant of them. You're a direct, I don't mean, eth, uh, uh, you know, physically, ethnically. I mean, you're a direct descendant of them spiritually, if you believe that. It goes right from them to the next believer, to the next to the next, all the way down to the year 2000, now 13. And they're still waiting for Jesus to come back. You know, but, but, but we need to teach. We need to teach. Just teach. Just teach. Just every time you have an opportunity. And that's just one thing. That's just one aspect. Okay. Thy word is truth. Now when it says the truth will make you free, it doesn't mean free to just be licentious and do whatever you want. Oh my gosh, I'm under no constraints whatsoever. Not under the law. You know, Paul had to deal with that in Romans, two times in Romans. You know, The guy who says, oh, oh, grace, grace, grace. Shall we sin that grace may abound? What? Yeah, may good night though. Absolutely not. Heck no, God forbid. What? One way of saying it. Yeah, but what are we freed from? Oh, Romans 6, verse 17. You can just write it down and listen to me. Romans 6, verse 17. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin you have become slaves of righteousness. How did I get freed from sin? Well, Romans 6.6 6 says, knowing this, that the old man was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be katergeo, deactivated. The body of sin has been deactivated with result so that we no longer are slaves to sin. No longer, no longer. Now, you know that the body of sin here is Paul's reference to the Adamic sin nature. Yeah, the Adamic sin nature. And that Romans, you know, i got to be careful here because I can go here on this. <laughs> Romans 7, 23 talks about the principle of sin that remains within. But we've already showed you that in Romans, uh, Romans 6, 6, if the body of sin has been deactivated, and Ephesians 2.3 says, you were, writing to the Christians, you were by nature children of wrath, good, meaning what? But no more. That nature is no longer there anymore. Now, 2 Peter 1.4, you are a sharer in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world through us. How do I stop this? How do I stop this? How do I stop this? You know, when a Christian says that to me, I love taking him. Here's a revelation for you. The Word says the body of sin has been deactivated. The Word says you were by nature a child of wrath, but no more. The Word says in Colossians 2 and verse 11. Oh, I got pages sticking together now. In Him you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. I didn't even do it. And so I say to this believer, I said, this thing you're struggling over that the Bible defines as sin, guess what? You're, it's, you're thinking you're bound to it and you're not. It's not a mind over matter issue. This is a Bible over matter issue. The Bible teaches that that body of sin, that sin nature, hasn't been just simply rendered powerless. I think that's a little anemic of a translation. It's been deactivated, katargeo. It's been removed, it says in Colossians 2.11. He calls it body of flesh. Here, over in Romans 6.6, 6, he calls it body of sin. And this was prophesied in Ezekiel 36, wasn't it? The Ezekiel 36... I'm not going to get through this teaching. Ezekiel 36... What is it, brother? 26, Yeah! which just shows who should be up here. Yeah, Ezekiel 26, I'm going to start at 
25, he says, that I will, this is a prophecy concerning regeneration, how God's going to regenerate his people. And I will sprinkle clean water on you. You will be clean. Well, that's not, that's not baptism water. That's not Presbyterian sprinkling of a baby either. The baby's not clean after that. The baby needs a towel. I love saying that to people. Well, I'm getting my kid baptized this Sunday, you know, and I was, if, if, if it's somebody's writing to me or if I'm on Facebook or Facebook, waste of time book, and I said, the only thing that's going to result, well, type, 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 the only thing that's going to result is the kid's going to need a towel. That's all it's in. Ah, that's it. I will sprinkle clean water on you. You will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from your idols. Watch, watch out. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit in you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. What's the heart of stone? That's the sin nature. That's the body of sin. That's the body of the flesh. That's the, you were children of wrath, but no more. By nature. See, there's no Bible, there's no biblical uh, phrase, there's no Bible that says Adamic sin nature. That's a theological paradigm, is all that it is. It's just a, it's, it's theological shorthand that is supposed to uh, inculcate the biblical teaching within it. See, so if I say justification by faith, well, that's a biblical statement. But there's a whole, when I say justification to you, right away, you think of what? Acquittal. Yeah, I'm just making sure you would think that. That's why I said that. Okay. All right. So, acquittal. I've been acquitted from the charges of sin against me. I just find that so incredibly free. So God, so God pardons you freely, to use a good Westminster Confession uh, uh, term, God pardons your sins freely in this act of justification slash acquittal. And then you think God saves you so that you can go on sinning at the drop of a hat? He saves you, justifies you, perfects you. You are perfect in Christ, Colossians uh, 2.10 says. Removes the Adamic fallen nature. That's what 2 Corinthians 5.17 is. If any man be in Christ, he's a new catesis. The old stuff has passed away. All things become new. Oh, except for the fact that you still have the Adamic sin nature inside of you. Wait, excuse me. Hold on one second. That doesn't even begin to compute. Back to John 8. So he says in this... It's okay. <laughs> it's in this distinctives of discipleship. There is the word. It is my word, Jesus says. It is knowing the truth because you've got my word and you are actually one of my disciples. And you know the truth. And as a result of knowing the truth, so you pick up this Bible, you can know the truth. If you're in Christ, you can know the truth because he's made that way for you. The Holy Spirit inside of you is your teacher. 1 John 2.20 and 2.27. Quit looking at the clock. 1 John 2.20 and 2.27. I'm not talking to anybody here. I just thought that'd freak you out real good. <laughs> 220 and 227. I know the truth, and that results in what? I'm free. I'm free from having to sin. I'm no longer a slave to sin. I just can't let go of this. And the truth will make you free. What do you want me to do, Lord? Back to Romans. Back to Romans. That's okay. We'll, we'll pick up on the second, third, and fourth point next week. I, I think this is uh, important. Looking back now, <laughs> looking back now on verse 6, if he has katargeo, the body of sin, right? Oh, Katargeo, the body of sin, that's been done away, katargeo, deactivated, for the, for the express purpose that you are no longer to be slaves of sin. The emphasis in the Greek is no longer at all. No longer does that sin nature, that body of sin, instruct you, boss you around, tell you what to do, what to look at, what to say, how to act, how to feel. That's done. That's over with. 
well then why do I keep struggling with it? Because you don't, number one, know this teaching. You still think you're prone to it. You still think you have a sin nature. By the way, I hope you're testing this stuff. I could be leading you down the primrose path. Not intentionally. But, you know, I appreciate the fact that you're trusting me, but don't be, you know, don't be a dummy about this. You know, what does it say on our, our Facebook page? Study hard, don't be stupid. Yeah, Carrie found, well, we found it together. It's a little moniker. Have you been to the Messiah Church? Paper? See, it says, uh, study hard, don't be stupid under there. I thought, stick that in there, honey. That's just enough bite, you know, just enough bite to, you know, but not to be overly offensive, like, they call us stupid on that page. No, I'm not, no. Study hard so you're not stupid, okay? Study hard so you're free in Christ. Who, how many want to be bound by that sin nature? See, this is so freeing. You've been set free, Colossians 2.11, by the removal of the body of the flesh. It has been removed by the circumcision of Christ. The circumcision of Christ, not made with hands. So it's not physical. It's not done by you. It's not done by somebody else. And so if that's the case, and I'm free from that. Verse 7 says, he who has died in Christ, crucified with him, verse 6, right? Is freed from sin, or is justified from it, acquitted from the charges of sin. Now, verse 11, even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin. Well, I can't if the sin nature is still in me. That rules, that reigns, that directs me, that gives me no choice but to head in that direction. But this is the revelation of this revolution that the body of sin has been katergeo. Therefore, verse 11, consider yourselves to be dead to sin but alive to God in Christ. Consider, logizomai, think on it, add it up, put it together, have it in your head all the time. At that moment of temptation, oh, by the way, if I don't have a sin nature, how come I get tempted? Because you're in the flesh still. Everybody wave your flesh hand around. This is it right here. Flesh hand, flesh hand. And this flesh hand reaches for fleshy things. And these flesh legs take me to fleshy places. And these flesh eyes make me look on fleshy stuff that I shouldn't be looking at. See? It's your bod. It's your passions. It's your weakness. It's your frailty. It's being human. Now, now, too often of the time, people have used that kind of thing as an excuse. Well, I can't help it. You know, kind of a thing. No, but you're under no constraint. The Bible says that the believer is under no constraint. Now, by the way, this is a determiner, this type of thing, can be a determiner for if somebody is, in, in fact, regenerate or not. That is part of it. You know, It's just that, too often the times, preachers, whether well-meaning or not, use that as a, as a bludgeon you know, to beat Christians over the heads with, to keep them in line. <sighs> you know, I mean... But there's another side to this coin, see? And we need to consider that. So he says... Therefore, verse 12, if that's the case, if I'm considering myself to be dead to sin, I got it in my noggin now because I have the truth of the fact that my sin nature has been removed. Therefore, I don't have to follow what it says. Your body may be saying, oh, but I want it, I want it, I want it. That's your body. That's not your sin nature. And he says, therefore, verse 12, do not let sin reign like a king. Now, I'm giving you the amplified deal. The idea of reigning is like reigning like a king would reign. Do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. The body has lusts. The body has strong desires is what that means. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin. I present my eyes to something I shouldn't see. I present my tongue to something I shouldn't say. My hands, my legs carry me to... Right? Okay? Just don't do it. Really? Yes, really. Because when you are convinced that this is the biblical teaching, that's why I give you these uh, over and over. And I'm going to keep giving these to you. I want, to, I want you to be free. See, see, this is, this is the point of the, of the first point of the teaching. That has four points to it, which I'm not getting to tonight. The, the distinctive of discipleship, before we get into this devilish, devilship stuff, which is deep and, and gross and, and that kind of a thing, but we'll deal with it next week. This distinctive of discipleship is word, truth, and freedom. The word of Christ, the truth, knowing the truth of the word of Christ, I can understand it, you can understand it, and what does it result in? I'm free. 
the freedom that the Bible talks about is not freedom to go out and just do whatever you want. It's not really freedom from the law as if I can be, you know, some sort of antinomian, somebody who is against law, you know, or something su superfluous like that. But it means I'm free from the things that God says I'm free from. And that's the sin nature and the uh, need to have to follow that sin nature. See, what you, a new believer needs to be taught some basic things right away, right out, right out of the right out of the spiritual womb, okay? One of these things has to be that you're not bound to that sin nature. It's been removed. It's been removed. And there's a clear demarcation and distinction between the sin nature and what Paul says remains inside of you in Romans 7, 23, the principle of sin. Now, I am absolutely convinced that there is no biblical bridge that connects the sin nature or the body of sin with the principle of sin. They are two separate things. Why is that in me when the nature has been removed? Well, number one, the nature can't be there if you're in Christ and if God is living inside of you. He doesn't move in and shoulder up you know, next to this vile, cancerous vomit of the Adamic fallen nature and buddies up to it. That, that's not happening. God doesn't do that. Scripture is it's contrary to that. Right? So then that's removed. If you're in Christ... All things have become new. Well, all things can't become new if you've still got the sin nature. You know what the sin nature is? The sin nature is the result of that horror story of a moment back in the garden where Eve says, uh, mm, tastes good, here, honey. And instead of smacking it out of her hand and backing away and praying for her, asking God to come here quick, you know, he says, okay, oh, See, and at that moment, and I, I really don't mean to make light of that, okay? I, but at that moment, that dark, black, pitch black, evil, cancerous pus of being separated from God, being wholly, absolutely different from what God is, and the opposite of what God is, comes into humanity and is passed on to every person born physically into this world. Everybody's got it. Everybody's separated from God. This is what Paul means when he says in Romans 5 that we are enemies and we are hostile to God. Because Adam brought that to us in the garden. I just thought of about five things in Genesis I'd like to show you right now. Maybe, yeah, I think I would just be doing that by me if I, if I did that. Therefore, because it's been removed in verse 12, 6, now in verse 12, you don't let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey its lust. You don't go on presenting the members of your body to sin. You don't have to as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead. What dead? The Adamic fallenness. You're alive. You've been raised with Him. That's verse 4. Therefore we have been buried with Him through baptism. That's not water. Into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with Him in the likeness of His death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of His resurrection. And so, he says, middle of 13, present yourselves to God as those who are alive from the dead. Verse 5, verse 6. And your members as instruments of righteousness to God. You say, is it that simple? It is once you have the revelation of the fact that the body of sin has been katergeo. Then you can, and it's like, I'm free. It's like, it's like a guy who's like in a prison, and he's been put here, right? And they've told him, you're in prison, you're in prison, you're in prison. The state has found you guilty of blah, 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 blah. I guess that's a crime, blah, blah, blah. The state has found you guilty, and you're going to stay in this cell, and you're going to, because we're telling you to, because you're guilty. And that's it. And that's all. This is your life now, these prison walls. And the jailer walks out, and he walks down the hall, and you're sitting there in your bunk, you know, and you're in prison, and I, I can't leave. I was told I can't leave, and that's it. I'm in prison. I committed these things, and there's guards all over the place here. You know, there's guards everywhere. And I'm in prison. And the prison door is wide open. I'm in prison. I'm a prisoner. I got it in my head. And the door is open. And somebody gets the bright idea 
that the charges against them have been dismissed, and they walk out the front door. And they keep walking. And you see this guy, you're sticking out your head out of your prison door here, and you see this guy walking, you know, he's, he's, hey, hey! You're not supposed to do that, you're a prisoner! Guy's totally wrong. Doesn't he know he's a prisoner? He's a prisoner. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love... And I go to church, and I, I'm reading my Bible with these, you know, with these glasses on that are obscuring my view. Oh, yeah, the body of sin has been rendered powerless. I'm no longer a slave to sin. Oh, God, thank you. I'm no longer a slave to sin. I'm no longer a slave. So don't... You think that guy's ever going to come back? How, how did he do that? How did he just leave? And one day, you just bowled up and you stick your toe out of the door a little bit. Nothing happens. Nobody smacks it off or anything like that. So you step out and you do the same thing. And you're looking around and there's nobody stopping you, but somebody's told you that you're a prisoner. See, I got this my entire Christian life. Has anybody ever heard a teaching like this that the body, the body of sin, the Adamic fallen nature has been removed and you don't have it anymore. <coughs> have you heard that before? Somebody other than me. Yeah. You have. Mm -hmm. Do you know who it was? <laughs> you see? That's why I say to you, you check this out. You make sure. I'm convinced of it. I'm absolutely convinced. In my spirit, I'll tell you what, it's like, oh baby. And so consequently, I'm not bound to nothing. If I do something, Paul says in Romans, the seventh chapter, uh, it, three different places, no, two different places in the seventh chapter, it's no longer I who do it. It's that principle of sin inside of me. I'm not even doing it because the I is my regenerate self. It's my regenerate spirit. I'm perfect. See, that's Hebrews uh, 12, 22, and 23. You have, got to, you have come to the place in heaven of the spirits of just men made. Yeah, perfect. Colossians 2.10. You're perfect in Christ. Complete in Him. You won't be any more perfect at the moment of your regeneration to the end of your life than you were at that moment of regeneration. That perfect, absolute righteousness of Christ imputed to you. And I don't have to do this. I don't have to be bound to this. But the unregenerate person, the person that does not confess, because they're not enabled to confess, Jesus is Lord by the Holy Spirit, that has not been enabled to believe in their heart that God has raised him from the dead, Romans 10, 9, and 10, because if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. But the person who can't do that, who hasn't believed unto that, because they've not been able to believe unto that, they've maybe mouthed some words in a church service or some Christian camp meeting or something like that. And it was an emotional moment. You know, and unfortunately, sometimes those are uh, legitimate. Sometimes they're just, yeah, they're just whitewash. It's just an emotional moment. You know what I'm saying? And now, you know, people get mad at me because then I say, okay, let's wait. Let's see what happens. L let's wait. Let's see what go is God's spirit inside of them. And are they going to, is there going to be transformation? I'm with you that it doesn't happen overnight. I got gotcha. you. Okay? But we should be able to see those wheels begin to step. It may be two steps forward, three steps back, but there is stepping forward that's going on. That's what the body is here for, to encourage that brother or sister along. And I'll tell you what, you make it even better for them, stronger for them, more positive for them, more immediate for them if you start telling them, hey, shh, come here. The sin nature's been removed. <laughs> and you tell them this, and, and they're like, what? What's that? Well, you've got to show them. Take them back into Genesis 3 and good dosings in the, you know, the first uh, five chapters of Romans, especially Romans 5, 12 through 18. <laughs> Romans 5, 12 through 18. And you go, this is what Adam did for us. And this is what Jesus did for us. He reached in, left his father's glory, came down, became a man, knowing that for all eternity... That act was going to cause him to be in submission. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 24 through 28. Submission 
to God the Father for all eternity, but because of the love wherewith he has loved us, his elect, his chosen ones, whom he would not leave in this destitute state, whom he would not leave dead, black, buried in the black ink cancer of the Adamic fallenness, but he yanked it out, delivering us, freeing us. A disciple is free. 14. For sin shall not be master over you, because you're not under law. Because that's what law does. But under grace. The law came in, Romans 5.20, so that the transgression would increase. That's the purpose of the law. 5.20 says. What then? What is it then? Verse 15. What should we do now? What's the result? What's Christian life going to be like? What then? Shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? Meganoito. Absolutely not. Do you not know that when you present yourself to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey? You see, you, we present ourselves as slaves to that sin thing, even though we don't have to. Nine times out of ten, and that's being gracious of me, nine times out of ten, people don't know that that's been removed. I didn't know that that was removed. I didn't find it in a commentary. I didn't read somebody's cool book. I just studied it out in the Word and it started to leap out. I give the Holy Spirit 100% glory and credit for it because I didn't see it for years. And then when I began to see it, you know what I did with it? Chelsea. Baby, I pushed it away. I said, no, that's not, that's not right. You're interpreting this wrong, Burks. God's going to hurt you. <laughs> You are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or obedience resulting in righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, were slaves of, slaves of sin, Ephesians 2, 3, you were by nature children of wrath, but no more. So you were slaves of sin, but no more. You became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed and having been freed from sin the body of sin, the act of sin, you're freed from it. You became slaves. You're still a slave. You're a doulos, but you're a slave of righteousness. That means I'm freed from wanting to do what I want to do, sin, what I want to sin, go where I want to go, say what I want to say, see what I want to see, abuse what I want to abuse, please me, please me. I'm free from all that, but I'm still a slave. But I've been made a slave. Yeah, it's by choice because your nature has been changed. But he made you the slave, first and foremost. You're the doulos. We're all slaves. Yeah. Having been freed from sin, we became slaves of righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms. I'm going to stop. Because of the weakness of your flesh, your body, your skin, your desire, your eyes, your passions. you got to watch out with Paul. Sometimes you got to be careful. You have to read Paul holistically, meaning you've got to read all of Paul and begin to categorize when he says, this is a sin nature issue, this is a body issue. Because sometimes he will use the word flesh for sin nature, and sometimes he uses it for body. And sometimes he just means the physical, and sometimes he means that which comes with our physicality, our frailties as human beings. Here, here's what he means by that. Because I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. Flesh here can't mean the body of sin because 6.6 6 says it's been removed. Hello? For just as you presented your members as slave to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. Here's 20. Here it is. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regards to righteousness. Look at 22. But now, having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Derive your benefit. Come on up and finish this. Come on. <laughs> you derive your benefit of resulting. You know what? It's, it's so fabulous. You know, it's like I, I see you, I hear, I hear him, and others of you do it too. You know, I see you mouthing things. You know, you're right there. With, there's just no greater blessing for somebody like me. Except to be married to the world's greatest woman. 
But now having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification and the outcome eternal life for the wages of sin is death. You don't have to pay that anymore. You don't have that. That's not in your checking account anymore. Death is departed from your savings, your bank of your life. It's no longer. You can't draw on it. It's over with. It's done. It's gone. Death has been absolutely defeated. Boy, that was a long quote of verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And you see, when you, when you many times somebody who is unregenerate will hear just that much right there. Just hearing it read, the free gift of God in Christ is eternal life. The free gift. It's a free gift. Why? And, and unbelievers, they're like, when they're under conviction by the Spirit for their sins, and they know that they're black, and they know that they're dead before the one true living God, they're hiding from Him. When Adam fell, And Eve fell. They hid in the forest. They hid behind the trees. They pulled the leaves down to cover themselves. They hide themselves. And when an unbeliever who is becoming regenerate hears that God wants to give them something for free, they're so ashamed to take it. They're so ashamed. But here's the good news. Here's the good news. Here's the good news. It's not up to you to take it. <laughs> it's not for you to go, okay, I'll put my hand out and take it. And it's like, all of a sudden, they're like, I believe Jesus died for my sins. I believe he rose from the dead for me. I didn't even ask for it. So now I guess I need to pray this prayer and make it all official or something like that. Nope, nope, nope. And it's at that moment, right when that happened right there, that the Adamic sin nature, it's gone. It's Jesus is, is, is very, he's a violent savior. Jesus is a violent savior. He didn't ask for your permission or nothing. He reached in, but my, my Adamic sin nature. It's mine. You know, you feel like, what's that critter's name in Golem? You know, my precious. That ring, you know, and it's mine. See? <clears throat> Sinners who are unregenerate, who are unregenerate, that's what they, they are about their sin nature. No, no, don't take, don't save me. No. You know, and they that's how it is. But but one who is being regenerated or has been regenerate, see, uh, it's just gone. They're going, oh my gosh. And it happens through the word. For the wages of sin is death. The paycheck of sin is death. That separation from God forever in the lake of fire, weeping, wailing, gnashing of teeth. Why? Because God's a meanie? No, because he is absolutely holy. And this is the only appropriate remedy and consequence for sin. That's his holy determination. And it's right. And all of a sudden you're going, yeah, God's right. Where'd that come from? I used to say, no, God, no, no, blah, 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 blasphemy, blasphemy. But now it's like, God's right. Where'd that come from? You know? Because now you're a new creation. Yeah, but, but, but wasn't there supposed to be an official moment where I had to like say this thing? Or Well, here's the deal. The Bible says, as you heard me quote earlier, in Romans 10, 9 and 10, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. You don't get saved by doing that. Because you're saved, you will do that. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. And Paul says in, in uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 12, nobody can say Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Spirit. Anybody can say the words. Anybody can say Jesus is Lord. Frame the words in your mouth. Jesus is Lord. That's not what Paul's talking about. It's a confession. It's a confession born of God's Spirit that he gives to you. And you know what? It's worship to him so you can declare his worthiness. Jesus is Lord. So you can, that's that's the believer's first step into worship. It's the words on his tongue, in his heart, Jesus is Lord. Yaki. I, I, you know, when you told me to look at what Paul was saying in the seventh chapter, you're going to teach on that. I did. And that really is a spring realization. And I have realized more than ever how much the flesh deceives us. Yeah. And, and so... Okay, if I'm trying to be good, am I doing works? I don't think so, because Romans 12, 1, 
says if we are to offer our bodies yeah. a living and holy sacrifice right. unto God. Right, right, exactly. And we can do that because of what you said, our nature is gone. Right, exactly, because the nature is gone. That that nails it right there. That's the only way you can do something like that. And, you know, it, just so everybody's clear, people who are watching on, on video and everything, you know, Keith is not suggesting that we do works so we can get saved, because that's anti-Bible. Um, that's Arminianism. That's Arminianism. Okay, I hear another series coming, and I have to stop, because I'm already really late, okay? <laughs> but what he's saying is, is because you're a new creation, then guess what? I'll never forget the day, Brian. Brian Munley back here. I'll never forget, not that I don't forget days when you and I, Brian, have, have shared things, you know, but... I'm, we're getting multiple names in this congregation. I'll never forget the day. I, it's been like, I want to say a year and a half or something like that ago. You, you came up to me. We were talking about Ephesians 2.10. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to, to walk in. I don't remember exactly what it was, the topic that you and I were discussing, but that, that moment is frozen in time for me in my mind. And I, I'll always remember that. You know one of the reasons I remember that text is because I always remember you saying it to me. I kid you not. I always remember you saying that to me. And how many times have I quoted that to you? Ephesians 2.10. Well, the Lord, you know, this may seem like a little thing, but it's a big thing to me because anytime the Lord categorizes Scripture or whole passages inside of me, I like the fact that he links it to a certain event. I'm going to be quiet in just a second. I like how he links it to a certain event in my life. And Ephesians 2.10 is, is linked in my life to, to Brian Munley. I don't even remember what it was we were talking about. I guess it doesn't matter. I don't know if you remember or not, but yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I always remember that. You know, you and I were out in the foyer of the building, and your back was to the door. You know, and I was standing in front of you, and you were just sharing something with me that the that the Lord had ministered to you. I think you. T well, it's coming back to me. I think you you had read it, uh, obviously, uh, in the Word. And, and I, that's all I remember. And it just, it was locked in there just like that, you know? So the distinctives of discipleship <laughs> are the word, truth, and now you know the extent to this freedom. And I didn't see this coming at all today because I thought I was, I thought, oh, I got a pretty good teaching you gave me, Lord. Great. This is compact. I can get this done in an hour. Yeah. All right. Well, Lord. How gracious and kind and good you are. How wonderful Christ Jesus, our Savior, you are. And Lord, we praise and magnify you, Lord, with all our bodies, all our souls, all our spirit, all our strength, all our might that we get from you, O Lord. Thank you, Lord, for this life, this life that is more abundant in Christ every day. And Lord, we just give you thanks for the word and how freeing it is. What a great thing. Thank you, Lord, for, for showing me and pressing me on this, Lord, and putting me in a corner over this, that you have removed the sin nature. I remember, Lord, I remember how I battled. Well, you remember, Lord, how I battled with that. It's like, well, nobody taught me that. I haven't read that. Nobody said that in any commentary. And Lord, you know, I scoured through the commentaries, and it's like I found some, I found some things that referred to that. But it wasn't very strong. And I thought, are you kidding me? This is revolutionary stuff. And you get all the glory for it, Lord God. So thank you that you you stopped my plans tonight, Lord, and took us in a different direction and, and just made us lean into this again one more time tonight, but coming at it from a different direction. And now, Lord, may your people find tonight, those who are here tonight, those who are listening uh, on online or watching the, the, the video, may they find what your word means by that true release and experience of that release from the Adamic sin nature. May their lives in Christ, shedding, shedding now, the chains of I think I have to sin and I have no choice, shedding that now and let them fly, let their wings sprout and let them fly now in their Christian life. In Jesus' name, amen.